Hello and welcome to the Indian Writers Forum and News Click. The general elections are just a few days away, and one of the key issues progressive sections across the country are raising is the assault on reason and science over the past five years. These assaults range from the fatal, as is seen in the attacks on rationalists, to farcical instances of pronouncements at the Indian Science Congresses, and a number of instances in everyday life. To talk more about this, we have with us Dr. Tejal Kanitkar. Dr. Tejal is the head of the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability Studies at the TISS. Hello. Uh, can we start by asking a very basic question? Like, when after, immediately after independence, there was this notion among the ruling classes, of course, and also among the people who had participated in the freedom struggle that science and scientific tempo were very important as far as the country's development was concerned. So it's a fundamental duty as far as the people of India are concerned, and there was a lot of focus on building institutions. So where exactly did we go wrong and end up in this current scenario, or was it uh, inevitable from the very beginning? No, I wouldn't say it was inevitable. Uh, one of the, I think, basic questions of how scientific temper and its uh, implementation or development in society was thought of was very closely tied to the idea of self-reliance uh, in the country. And uh, while this emphasis was more or less uh, universal across various sections, with a few exceptions, of course, uh, there was a definite disagreement in terms of how this was to be actually implemented and how it would come about. So Nehru's idea was one of uh, uh, developing domestic scientific capability and uh, the development of productive forces, modern technology, to build a modern secular nation. Ambedkar's vision was uh, very much uh, aligned with this vision, but it took it much further and he spoke about the importance of uh, the need for radical social transformation and the annihilation of caste. But we had other trends as well. We had the Gandhian uh, uh, trend where, where there was a definite uh, uh, regressive position vis-a-vis uh, -vis modern technology, even if not to modern political thought. But uh, you had Gulwalkar as well, who was definitely uh, not against maybe technology in the same way, but was against modern science as Western and hegemonic. But of course, uh, one can say quite safely that Nehru and Ambedkar really prevailed in post-colonial India and uh, therefore we see some effort towards the building of modern scientific institutions. But because uh, the second part, the element that was important, one is of course the breaking out of pre-modern social relations, the annihilation of caste, that program was never really implemented. And education in some sense, uh, unlike a lot of the developed countries, India never had a golden era of education. We never really expanded the scope of uh, even universal education and much less so in terms of higher education. So its reach uh, remained limited to a large extent and coupled with the fact that we had uh, social relations, pre-modern social relations that existed in society, uh, have now sort of made it easier for regressive te uh, tendencies that speak against scientific temper and uh, the development of science that have re-emerged uh, and they do um, question on ideological grounds the tenets of uh, science and scientific temper that were earlier uh, taken for granted in terms of at least state policy. So one of the topics you have talked about in one of your speeches is the concept of everyday obscurantism. And I think one of the understandings that we had was that as time passes and society develops, superstition, obscurantism and all will vanish as we thought about caste also. Many people had the same understanding. Yes. Whereas I, I would think what we notice is that as time has passed, they have actually adapted over time. So how do you see this working out in day to day life actually? Yeah. So one of the things I think is that, uh, you know, the development of science and to whatever little extent we have had some development of science doesn't automatically translate to the development of scientific temper. Right. For that you need uh, material changes in society and there we have lagged uh, uh, behind quite a lot. And uh, we continue to, uh, I and this is not just in terms of the masses which have very little, probably a lot of people have very little agency to combat uh, everyday obscurantism in their life and so even confront structures of power. But the classes which uh, should actually be the vanguard for taking this fight ahead uh, don't really take this up very strongly because we do not have uh, that kind of commitment to materialist thought uh, that is required. So we have a class of liberals that uh, falls into familiar patterns of uh, you know, arguing against constitutional values in favor of tradition. Uh, we've seen it very recently in the Sabrimala uh, issue. Uh, in whenever at the smallest excuse and the smallest uh, sign of trouble. 
So, uh, so it is a larger political movement, and uh, there had there were efforts uh, at at one point of time uh, by Indian scientists uh, also to make this into a movement. There were science movements, but it never really became. Uh, uh, there was never really enough pressure on the state to actually take this up strongly, and so we do not have this uh, the the intellectual classes, both from the sciences and the social sciences, who should actually be at the forefront of the fight for materialist thought against obscurantism. We don't have a strong enough class of intellectual liberals also in that sense. And uh, that is, I think, uh, a major reason why everyday obscurantism prevails. And this is also going to be, say, accelerated in the next couple of years considering the kind of changes that are being proposed in the education system of course of course this is uh, of course there there is a, a definite political agenda to that right so uh, if the rss wants to implement its uh, political agenda of the hindu rashtra then you have to enforce a religion uh, the supremacy of religion over science and critical thinking you can't have people questioning things in your past or you know questioning history uh, so you cannot have people questioning why uh, things look the way they look uh, in society and so you have to for for everything other than uh, you know technological development you simply turn to religion to look for answers uh, and even technological development i think uh, you know in the talks that i've given previously have been a little more uh, uh, generous to this particular uh, section of uh, people, but even technology for them is important only in some sectors. So, you know, ASAT uh, missiles are important, but it's not as if, you know, we are talking about self-reliance in a lot of other sectors also, in our industrial capabilities remain severely limited. But of course, space and weapons is something that they consider important. So, uh, there's definitely a political agenda to making the, cha the kind of changes that we see in our education system. And it's a danger because we don't seem to have a coherent opposition that seems to be fighting against this, these changes. We have, there, there has been some movement uh, against this. You know, the science academies wrote a joint article against the kind of intolerance to, uh, you know, uh, pluralism that is seen by this government. But uh, a, cons a consolidated and concerted political uh, fight back that is required requires a strong uh, philosophical underpinning as well, which we seem to be lacking at this point. And it's also interesting to note that uh, the sectors in the engineering sector, for instance, so whether it be the IITs or the thousands of colleges that have mushroomed across the country, there is a very clear effort to make sure that they are completely isolated from politics or anything of that sort which actually serves his agenda as well. Yes, and not just isolated from politics, I think uh, the, the notion that uh, you do good science, you do good technology in your laboratory, but there is nothing about it and your understanding of science that really translates outside the laboratory. And uh, you make every possible effort to make sure that that happens. And that is coupled with the fact that you also, uh, you have students uh, there who are burdened with so many, so I mean, I look at the fees that uh, IITs and IIMs now charge, uh, you're simply creating a bunch of uh, people who are uh, going to be completely burdened with uh, extremely high loans and they have to look for jobs and uh, any any kind of political opposition is far away from their uh, consciousness at this point because they really uh, are worried about other things. So you have a neoliberalism on the one hand that is uh, making sure that students are not allowed to ask questions and on the other hand you have an agenda of uh, ensuring that you know, uh, the supremacy of religion over science remains. And both of these coupled together ensure that there is no opposition anymore. And one of the other points you talked about is the need for a commitment to modernity. Now, at least in some intellectual sections, there is a skepticism of this concept, the notion of modernity. There is a claim that it's exclusionary, that, it's, that it presents only a hegemonic point of view. So how do you respond to uh, these questions in the light of your comment? Yeah, I think when I, when I talk about the intellectual classes that are... Uh, subservient to the ideology of the ruling elite. It is not just the scientists and the, and, and, the, and the engineers, it is very much also the social scientists who are unfortunately not held to the same standards when it comes to uh, uh, being taking positions against obscurantism. And they are free to be as obscurantist as they want a lot of times with the facade of radicalism attached to it. But essentially their positions are highly anti-materialist and they aid the ideology of the ruling elite. Uh, in uh, in many different ways, because if you deny uh, the fact that uh, one can actually objectively study society, then anybody's uh, position is valid. The the perspective of uh, uh, a man 
who thinks that there is no patriarchy in society as a, is as valid as the perspective of a woman who is burdened under its, uh, uh, under its weight. And this is probably a caricature and it's not always as uh, you know, openly or explicitly claimed as this. But uh, it is uh, uh, very serious because you're essentially confusing the appropriation of uh, technology for profit as an attribute of technology itself. Yes. And it is nothing but confusion. And both, uh, on the one hand, you have the glorification of tradition, uh, uh, the glorification of obscurantism as tradition. On the other hand, you have the romanticization of tradition as culture and lived experience, right? right? And both of these aid the agenda of the ruling elite and uh, go against the, the, the idea of creating a just and equal society. And I think that therefore both are dangerous and they have to be fought. And, uh, um, and those of us who are really interested, because the fight for uh, science and scientific temper is very much tied to the fight for justice and equality. And uh, if one has to really think about uh, uh, creating that kind of a society, that kind of a nation, then one has to fight both these tendencies. Right. And this is also not necessarily only in Indian. Uh, issue, so to speak. So, for instance, in the US recently, we've had a measles outbreak spurred by the anti-vaccine movement. Mm -hmm. And climate change denial is still a very fashionable thing in many circles. Mm -hmm. So how do you connect this to a global context also, in the sense that? I think the, the climate change and the anti-vaccination come from two different streams oh. of uh, thought. With climate change, uh, uh, you know, fortunately, I might say, there has been some, uh, because uh, uh, somebody who's as disliked as uh, President Donald Trump is a climate de uh, change denier, uh, people who have, uh, would have otherwise uh, been skeptical of the results of science are a little wary about uh, taking anti-climate change right. positions. But uh, so, you know, the, the, some revision of their positions uh, has come about in terms of you have to, because after all, what we know about climate change is because of science. Um, Whereas uh, in the other case, it is, uh, you know, this entire uh, idea of the pharmaceutical uh, companies as being really hegemonic and, uh, you know, an intra powerful interest group pushing vaccines onto people is, uh, is very much obscurantism uh, wherever it is in the world. And, you know, unfortunately, we are also prey to it in India, uh, very much so. Uh, and uh, this is, this is in... In my most generous moments, I can uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, say that, okay, maybe this is, this position arises from the fact that the promise or the emancipatory potential of science has remained just that. It has only remained a promise for a large majority of the population. But at the core of it, the idea is the same, that you confuse the, uh, the relations of production and the iniquity of the relations of production with, as an attribute of the science itself. It is not about who controls the science and who controls the technology, but it is about the science and the technology. So use, use these as proxies. And which I think uh, is a confusion that actually creates problems like this. They're, they're fatal confusions in many cases. So we have to be really very, very careful and fight back against these quite strongly. And in terms of the fight back, what do you see as the key st steps or the key agenda, the key agenda that needs to be pursued in order to mount this fight back? Well, I think uh, a, a, a conscious mobilization. So we already have science movements in this country, right? Uh, They're not as strong as they used to be at one point of time, but they began with this agenda of fighting uh, superstition, obscurantism, etc., and taking science to the people. Uh, this has to be consolidated uh, as a strong political movement uh, with a very uh, thorough study and uh, propagation of materialist thought. I've said this before. Uh, and it has to be taken to the people very strongly. Uh, you have to take, uh, you know, we have to bring together energies from various uh, sectors, walks of life, and definitely academia and the intellectual classes have to be very much a part of this, uh, you know, uh, this, this agenda of taking this uh, idea forward. And it, it is important that uh, the, the fight for fight against irrationality cannot simply remain uh, cannot simply remain a fight for creating awareness about science we have to make sure that we fight against some of the biggest irrationalities in our society and that is the caste system and patriarchy these are both irrationalities that we do contend with in daily life and if our science movements if taking science to the people does not include fighting this rationality uh, irrationality then uh, it's not going to succeed Sabrimala is a good example and is a good, uh, you know, hook. it has both the elements of caste and the elements of uh, gender 
uh, in it and uh, it is actually uh, a place where our fight should now at this at this point should begin from uh, to fight against uh, these kinds of tendencies to uh, you know make sure that uh, society our society remains irrational in many ways thank you Dej. Thank you. that's all we have time for today keep following the indian writers forum and newsletter